All right, let's get started. <clears throat> so, um, this piece right here, it's a bit, it complicates it. I get mixed feelings when watching it, and I'm not sure it's a deliberate thing by the artist. I think it's a, I know you wanted to combine something ugly and beautiful, but it's like having a picture of Luna Lovegood, which she looks very much like. Uh, Lovegood, yeah, one word and then putting a picture of a spider beside her. She she actually has the exact same expression here and here, but just, you know, just get a big picture of a spider and just put a spider here, like a big ass tarantula. Tarantula. This is the exact equivalent. <clears throat> so so combining this picture, all right, with this picture, combining two opposing themes, it, it takes a lot more thinking than just putting a smiling princess beside an ugly spider. You can't expect them to synthesize right away. You can't expect it to just work. There has to be a, a deliberate attempt at combining and, and, and merging these two themes together. Right now, all I see is theme number one and theme number two. What we should see is theme number one and theme number two. There should be an area where they overlap in the painting, so the theme is continuous and seamless. Right now, there is a de de definite the uh, seam between the themes. This means that this area feels like this, and there's an actual border that I see, and then this area feels like this. If you want to combine the themes together, you have to think a little bit more deeply. You have there has to be a little bit more thinking. What's with the spider? The narrative has to be there. What's with the What's the spider doing? What is the spider a symbol of? Um, uh, Black Widow, uh, killing your boyfriend, a uh, heartbreaker. I mean, what is she? What is she? What does she have to do with the spider? You can't draw something as innocent and pretty as looking as Luna Lovegood, <clears throat> and then put a spider beside her and say, "Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm juxtaposing two major themes." You're not only juxtaposing two major themes. You're, it looks like you're just, you know, having a, a studying along a canvas, and you just happen to study a spider, and then the other day you happen to study a face. Do you understand what I'm saying, Mr. Greatness? He said he tried to make the girl's hair a spider web. Still, the expression, it's a portrait. What is it? What is the expression adding to this? What is the expression? Is this expression solemn? Is the expression distant? Is the expression um, uh, depressed? Uh, is it melancholy? It's just pure serenity. It, the, her face is just just pure innocence and, and, and just, you know, that's it. If we had her exact facial expressions and maybe this expression, which looks a little menacing, I don't know why the photographer thought to make this angle on her. She's so innocent. I mean, she is mysterious, but she's not going to cut your balls off, so I don't know why she was posed like, in any case, you can have something like this kind of expression with a downturned, uh, downturned portrait. This would express something in incoming, something about to happen, deeper thoughts in the portrait and less of a smile. If we had less of a smile and the spider was on her shoulder, at that point we're successfully juxtaposing two themes and overlapping them. The way you did it, she has this uh, um, kind of like a, what's that word for, like a, con like a conquest, like the face of, con you know, like the face of success, and then just the spider. That's how it feels when you painted this. This, along with the fact that the, the grayscales are completely washed out, there is almost no contrast happening in the painting. The spider takes the stage, but the spider is in the lower corner. Um, this whole area is empty. We need to push her a little bit more towards the side. It can still be asymmetrical, but we need to fill the space just a little bit more. And, uh, and then just take, take the dark spots further. Probably use a light. This light you're using is very nondescript. Extremely um, flat, just flat. Maybe casting some longer shadows. In photography, and fashion photography mostly. They avoid long shadows because they kind of hide a lot of the form. So casting a longer shadow and getting rid of that smile might might bring in that theme that we want to see, which is the theme of whatever the spider is in in, in, in you know, that as I always talk about the tropes, what is what what uh, what symbol does the spider come with? What connotation does the spider come with? So these areas could all be just shadowed over here. A little less wonder in her eyes. She has wonder in her eyes, all right? This this is causing major issues. 
this wonder in her eyes is not allowing me to connect the two together. Me as the viewer who grew up reading about spiders as, as a symbol of Halloween, and then I'm getting this, this, this wonder and beauty in her eyes. What's happening exactly? What is... What are they? What 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 connects the two? So what I'm doing to her face is that overlapping of the two themes, and we have that little bit overlap. I forget what this kind of graph is called. Um, something chart. I don't know. It's not it's something chart. I forget what that call. What that's called. I used the term the other day, but okay. So if we if we try to work like this, um, her neck feels a little bit long. Bring in some dark spots, and um, and it'll it'll be a little bit more uh, progressive. It'll be a little bit more um, connected and more seamless with the themes. <coughs> All right, the green that you chose also confused things just a little bit. It made me feel a little queasy. Green is just that color. I've just been raised by you know the '90s and Goosebumps. And um, and and uh, Ghostbusters to assume green is more of that ominous bile color. It's not really ominous. It's just more of that kind of gross boogery bile 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 color. And when we use that as a wash on a already washed out, no contrast canvas, we really feel like there is um uh, there there is a you know just entirely disconnected themes. So this is what happens when we take on advanced forms of, this is what happens when we try to do masterpieces. Uh, we have this happen. So this is an amazing theme to jump into, this, this uh, combination or the comparison, but it's a very mature theme, which is cool that you tried that, to combine you know, beauty and, uh, and the opposite of beauty and horror or the macabre. So. I really want to um, invite you to study these separately and try to think a little bit more along a narrative. What's what is the actual written form of this of this? The best way to tie in the themes in your in your painting in your masterpiece that you're going to be spending a lot of time in, so you're going to have to give it some thought. The best way to tie the themes together is to write a written version to make a written version of the painting. How would you, in a paragraph, write the combination of these two? You don't say, "Oh, I was trying to combine beauty and with with the macabre." I, I, that's not what you say. What you say is uh, a, an empty mind, uh, an ominous memory, a memory though a content and beautiful face has the, a creature of death behind those eyes. Something, something, something poetic. Because this is all poetics right here. You combining these two. This is not scientific momentary uh, glimpse in the sci in a, to a scientific mind. No, this is poetic. So there needs to be a written version of it, at least something that you speak out loud that, that makes you feel what you're writing. If the narrative isn't strong, the, 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 the canvas, the time you spend on the canvas won't be very long. So those are my thoughts for this painting, okay? Any questions? They need to be asked like right now or else I'm just going to move on to the next um, <clears throat> I've been here a long time, but I always miss the streams. Mm -hmm. Hey, Irish, it's been too long. Uh, still, her face, Kaj Kasprizik, uh, her face was still filled with so much wonder and so much happiness and contentness. It felt like a cover to a Pride and Prejudice book cover instead of, you know, a combination of the ugly and the macabre and the beautiful and the serene. It, they were just too severed. The themes were not connected at all. The only thing that connected them is that uh, green color that, that really made no presence in the painting. It affected nothing. <clears throat> so grayscale the image. Try to rethink. So this is, this is what I, what I um, want you to do, Mr. Greatness. If this theme is really important to you, if it has a personal connection to you, Take it home. Not take it home. It's it's not a real class. Um, I mean, we're not in a room, but just you know, go home. <laughs> go to your computer. Um, open up the the Photoshop. The Photoshop. Oh my God. Open up Photoshop and um, grayscale everything. Rewrite what you wanted to compare initially, and try to connect 
her beauty to the spider, make the spider a little bit more beautiful than usual, and make her a little bit more spidery than usual. They still will be a beautiful woman and a spider. They will be severed in that way, but she will have overlapped the two themes together, at least visually, and then try to rewrite exactly what you were going for. As you can see, a masterpiece isn't just a matter of drawing good. A masterpiece really involves uh, a lot of thinking. It's not just about drawing well, it's about thinking thoroughly. It's about thinking about the narrative, about applying all of these themes together on a narrative level and then on an emotional level and then on a symbolic level. So you're using the spider and the beautiful face and then on an artistic level you're casting really long dark shadows, really sharp shadows that are hiding some of her face to instill that mystery. Maybe rethink the the the, the the superior kind of attitude in her pose, her neck, her chin is very high, her nose is very high, so she's very proud. Maybe make her tilt her head down like we saw with that Luna Lovegood reference. That way we're really thoroughly on many levels of uh, visual and literary addressing the combination and juxtaposition of those two themes. If you're not doing any, any of that, it's just going to look like a spider beside a pretty girl. That's it. It's going to feel very flat. Um, thank you, Nautica. Uh, could you get it later? Sure, Mr. Greatness. Just message me on, on Facebook. I don't email people back. <clears throat> Go to your room. <laughs> and open up the Photoshop. <laughs> yeah, th thank you for that word, Rosalinda. The mood. Uh, I think there wasn't much of a mood. The mood was, you know, one corner had one mood, the other corner had one mood, and then he had that green pop up out of nowhere. Uh, green seems like a very joy, joyous and kind of, it's either joyful color because it's so saturated. Green doesn't exist unless there's a lot of light shining. Look at the great trees outside. There's not much green in, at night time. It turns into more of a blue and a, more of a gray. Green lo needs a lot of yellows and green has a lot of yellows, has a lot of sunshine in order to show off. So it's kind of like a joyful color or like a color of bile. It's either gross or really cute. Um, so be careful with greens and yellows in your painting if you want to rethink the color. Go for more darkly cool colors like nighttime colors or really, really strange pinks, really overly saturated fuchsia colors. Um, these will, will help envelop the painting, envelop the theme in a, in a unifying color that comes with the connotations attached to it already. So like death or loneliness or sadness or melancholy or mystery or depression or whatever else you know, whatever you can call upon with colors. Uh, there's been a debate, according to my recent video, that I've seen a lot of people commenting and refuting every every little fact that I present them with by saying, hey, it's the new age. We can do whatever we want. We can add whatever color we want with whatever color we want, and that's it. No, it's not like that. Maybe in your little world it is, but in the real world there are, there are years and years and years of uses of color centuries and centuries of different of, of, of developing the language of one particular color blue is a royal color was expensive to make red was a very royal color expensive to make expensive to own brown is the color of a slave a color of a serf a color of someone who is uh, more connected to the earth black the color of witches the color of, of mystery the color of the warlocks wore the color the color of death the color of the angel of death was always wearing black he wasn't wearing pink so that's why I'm saying in a war environment we're we're not going to wear pink, run around with pink, so people can find us and throw a spear in our, in our back. No, we wear camouflage colors, practicality, um, uh, the colors of war, the colors that, you know, if, if you're like a royal person in war, if you're a big fat hero in the middle of battle, maybe wear a feather on your head so they can find you and kick your ass or you can kick their ass. I mean, there's there's so many predefined, a color just doesn't come naked. It col comes with years and years of literary uh, influence and definition. So you can't just throw whatever color you want because you feel like it. That's bad design. That's bad. That that's really bad design thinking, and that shows you as a weak designer that you're always using the excuse, "Well, I'm just being unique, and it's my right to be unique." I'm I'm really tired of that. Um, tired of that excuse. It, think a little bit, is what I'm saying. What's the color of money exactly? Um, depends which country. I think some of them are pretty universal, Zoko, uh, considering how the colors that, that, that unify different uh, regions across, you know, across seas and oceans, the, the stories of the Brothers Grimm, the, sto the fairy tales, um, the, the great epics, the Norse epics, uh, the, uh, the, 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 
the, the Arab heroes, the heroes of Olympus, all of these the stories have been heard across the world and they come with their own colors. They come with the colors of gold and the colors of, of riches and the colors of, I mean, you're not going to put, you're not going to use gold on, on a poor guy's armor. If he's a, if he's a guy who just got some armor, you're not going to use gold on it. You're going to use gold for, for the guy whose armor is really, really, um, rich. A guy who's rich, who has armor, just think about... Uh, the Lannisters and the colors they wear. The Lannisters wear these really <clears throat> Lannister armor. These these really gaudy colors, gold and red. Those are their colors because they're rich and they're assholes. And they wear these two colors to invite uh, to invite that uh, image of themselves. But then you work. Then they think about the Starks armor in Game of Thrones. And they're wearing camouflage, practical colors that keep them hidden in, in, in their environment. They, they know how to live in the north. They know how to endure the north. It's always covered with furs, and, and um, even the animals that live in the north have camouflage colors. You're not going to find a red fox in the north. You're going to find dire wolves. You're going to find gray colors and brown colors and earthy colors to help camouflage. Practicality. Um, so these are the colors that come with practicality. Brown, leathery, uh, um, grays, lots of grays. It's just none of that gaudy shit because it's not a royal family. They are a massive, they're a royal family. It's not like a crazy ass, you know, we're rich and we know it colors here. So the designers here didn't say the guys who were hired paid, paid millions of dollars by the, the Game of Thrones, by, 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 uh, uh, those those fucking the studio behind this HBO they didn't pay the millions of dollars so they can come in and give give uh, Tywin Lannister a pink sash okay just because they want to just because they want to be unique no they gave him a red sash and of course uh, when uh, when Ty I mean when uh, George R R Martin wrote it even then um, it comes even before that that choice was made already and, and I'm I'm not really sure with the with the books exactly what colors everything always changes between books and movies but. Even then, that red color is known thoroughly as a color to represent richness, to represent power, to represent blood and conquest. If we wear any color in battle, we wear this. Um, and, uh, and that is my rant. <clears throat> On to this next one. Uh, and if you don't like what, what you hear in my, in my channel, you're free to leave. You're free to go. You're free to just find someone else who'll tell you something else. who will tell you you're a special little butterfly and you can do whatever you want. But honestly, that's never been my way. I, I, I appreciate the literature that came before me. I have an appreciation for the classic, classical color choices and the classical design and the classical compositions. And I apply them to my work because I trust the masters as more learned than I am. And I'm just carrying their message. <clears throat> okay. Right here, what we have is a very baby face. If there was like a weird looking baby elf dude and in a, in a, in a pack of little elf miscreants, then one of them would have this face. But I would not give this face right here to a guy who um, is a hitman for hire, his weapons of choice um, is a bat and brass knuckles. I would not give him this tiny little jawline. If I was the designer and I got to be the god for a day and I got to design this guy, I would give him the biggest jawline you've ever seen. He grew up big. He grew up as a big guy. Probably a lot of people tease him about how big he is. And so he put his skills to use. He put his strength to use and became, a, 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 like, you know, a, a hire, a guy for hire. He wasn't known as Babyface. He wasn't known as that. He probably grew up thinking, oh, why am I so big? Why do all the people bully me? Now I feel sorry for him. <clears throat> but still, uh, he eventually... It led him, his life led him to becoming a hitman. Do you see how important it is to have a narrative? When we have a narrative, we make better design choices. So good job on giving him that massive brow bone, that Neanderthal brow, and that, and that nose shape. But you really need to show that he, this guy has got, you know, he can kick ass. He's got a picture of a wolf and the word Max uh, as a tattoo on his um, arm. So he's not going to look very, uh, very intimidating with just a couple of tattoos. It takes more. It takes a storyline, a body type. Our body types are noticed by other people, and so our lives are shaped by other people, how they react to our body type. If we're a tall, beautiful woman, it will change our life. If we are a skinny little man, it will change our life. If we are a fat person, it will change our life. People will react to us differently and shape our identity and our reaction to their, to their ideas of us. This is how you create a character. This is how good writers make good characters, create good characters, by thinking about how they, I keep going back to Game of Thrones, but how they look and how that's changed their character. Thinking about, think about the dwarf, Tyrion Lannister from, sorry, I was just 
Game of Thrones fever. I'm sorry, but he was a he was a dwarf. He was a he changed his personality forever. It changed the way he talked. It changed the way he dressed. It changed the way he carried himself. The kind of personality he was. Of course, we can't control the actors that we choose, but he was described as a very very handsome looking guy. But he always had that one last little uh, issue, which was his height, that led to the shaping of his character. That led to his courage or his um, honesty with people. Um, he's just a very honest guy, so he had very kind eyes, and I think they cast him very well. He had very kind eyes because he was an understanding character. So if you had to create a kind dwarf that was very smart and witty, but also very empathetic at heart, you would give him very big, kind eyes, very big, expressive eyebrows. <clears throat> but if this guy here is not kind, is not kind in any way, shape, or form, he's just a big asshole who, ki who kicks people's asses, you want to shrink his eyes and shrink our accessibility to his emotion, maybe even remove his eyebrows. That said, his ears. Uh, when I create caricatures for uh, for 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 you know like uh, stupid orcs, like there's the smart orc, there's the brute orc, there's just the fucking nightmare orc, like the white orc from Lord of the Rings, uh, from The Hobbit, um, and then there's uh, then there's like, the idiot orc, the idiot among them, and he's always got those big Dumbo uh, Dumbo kind of uh, ears because they make him look dumpy and uh, and uh, kind of like a fool. Big ears are just a silly thing to look at, and it's, I'm sorry if you have big ears. This is, this is the truth. I'm sure you're a very cute person, um, but uh, they're cute is essentially what I'm saying. Baby face. A baby is essentially what it's coming to. Uh, baby, right? So they have big old ears. They're big, dumpy, stupid-looking things. <laughs> um, they're cute, and we don't want an orc to have any of these features unless it's deliberate. If we give them these big, dumpy ears, we show them this, you know, un undeveloped. A uh, silly, cute-looking thing. So if we have an orc with big old ears, if we have a, an orc-like character with big ears, he's not going to look very intimidating. So if we want to make him look look uh, very intimidating, we're going to have to give him these um, these small ears that kind of fit right into the sides of his head and match his. Well, he's an orc. He needs these. He, it's his it's his personality, but the way they match with the rest of his head. Very sharp, very intimidating, not dumpy, not droopy, not round. Everything about him is streamlined, the way they designed him. And they're tucked right in the sides of his head. We don't see the shape of his ears, like unless they're flapping, I guess. But over here is a good example of the model itself. We don't see it, it's just tucked right into the sides. No massive earlobe, no round Dumbo looking. Just remember Dumbo. If it's Dumbo shaped ears, then it's not going to look intimidating. His ears are small compared to the rest of his head. <clears throat> and if we look at him, let's see uh, the mountain. Mountain. We just basically want to copy his head, head size. Small ears, massive jawline, small head at the top. Just a big brute looking character. So you want to copy this large jawline. You want to apply all these changes here. If you make his ears look Dumbo-ish and very, um, very big like this, even if he's another creature, even if he's not a human, even if he's a fantasy character, you don't want to give him these big Dumbo ears. Um, if he is, we can just use the exact model they used for the white orc and give him this. This is a lot more intimidating. It's not big, it's nice and small and it has that streamline look to it. Okay? So those are my two cents on your character. I would add more hair out back here. The head seems cropped. <clears throat> All right. Now he kind of feels like a hitman. He kind of feels like a brute, um, like, a, like, a, like a henchman. So again, another reference that I have is Cyber 6, that show from the 90s. And there were these henchmen there that had the typical henchman face, but they were the biggest idiots. And it's because they made their eyebrows so expressive. Um, Cyber Six henchmen. Uh, where are they? They were these hilarious looking dorks, but they were big. They were just overly sized, and they had all those. I don't know where, where they are. But um, but yeah, look up this show. There's a definite uh, presence of these um, of these like this unifying themes between character design. It's just always elf versus the ogre. Um, yep. <clears throat> Any questions? Uh, is there
there even are there even woman woman orcs? Yeah, I'm sure they just look as as burly and big as the orcs from that that new uh, like you know I'm, I'm sure the character design artists in Blizzard they had to do the movie and they had to show the female orcs. I'm sure they know. Okay, we're gonna have to make them orc-ish, bigger than the usual female woman, no way slender. And because there's this one one of the protagonists in the new movie, if you've ever seen the trailer, she looks so feminine. She doesn't look anything like an orc because they had to make her look really pretty. The one that falls in love with the what with the human. If you've ever seen the the, the 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 what's it called? World of Warcraft trailer for the new movie, you should go watch it. Uh, the girl in there looks so girly. She, uh, she's supposed to be an orc, but they made her so pretty. But every other female just looks like a female orc. Same as the orcs we see, um, the kind of trolls in Shrek. Shrek 4 or Shrek 3, I don't know which one it is, but it's the one where you meet the other orcs. They all look big and burly too. <clears throat> but they still look a more feminine, less massive jawlines. All of these are applicable. So this doesn't feel intimidating. His face feels mousy to me. It feels babyish, like an angry baby. Um, instead of someone that has years and years seasoned in the art of killing a human being. Uh, I don't think his, if he started off looking this scrawny, I don't think it would have led him into this. Maybe he would have been the mob boss. Maybe he would have been the intelligence. He has less brawn, uh, brahm or whatever the word is, and um, had to uh, had to make up for his lack of strength for in with intelligence. And he had to learn to be witty and, and survive the streets by being witty. All of this is what I, as a writer, with strong design power, if I want to have strong design power, I have to think like this and make this character um, less burly if I wanted to make him a witty character. If I wanted to make him a massive character, big guy, always been big, always bullied people around, always misunderstood, probably can't read, uh, spent too much time in his childhood beating other people up and taking their money, and he probably would have end up, ended up being a hitman. Not smart enough to own a company or be a lawyer or whatever, he just ended up being professional at what he, what he does, which is overpowering people and killing them for money. Right? It's that it, there, We go that deep, we go that far um, when we design. And if you're not thinking like that, you're not designing, you're just putting things together and hoping something comes out of it, hoping you get a reaction. <clears throat> that's not strong react. Uh, that, I mean, that's not strong uh, design power for a reaction. All right, so this eye, the eyes, the face, the whole face seems a little bit small for the head, especially the eyes. I feel like they should be just a little bit bigger for her head size. You'll see in a second how small they felt. But um, I'll show you real quick. I felt very, very small. Any questions? <clears throat> He had to survive the streets, son. You can still make it more square shapes to make it look like stronger and more powerful. Yeah, you can edit what you already have and replace the rounded, um, dumpy looking, uh, dumbo looking uh, ears with something more like the white orc. Really streamlined, sharp, a triangle. What's more intimidating? Remember it last class. What's more intimidating? A circle or a triangle. Don't use any circles in there. Try to use squares and triangles and things with sharp edges. It will look intimidating. All right. So before, it's like you drew the, it's like you're trying to make it so that the bangs don't hide the eyes. Don't be afraid to hide the eyes under hair. I mean, this shouldn't change their size. Before after. The eyes were a little bit too small. Um, as for militarily, just like going back to that circle and not being uh, intimidating, um, I think you should try to at least wrap her, uh, that beanie on top of her head. Beanies make me laugh. I don't even know what the big deal is with beanies. But um, try to make it wrap around her head a little bit more geometrically. Something that looks a little bit more like that. <clears throat> that way it looks less like a beanie. It looks less silly. A circle is silly. A circle can be silly. A squiggly line is silly. A triangle is not silly. A square is not silly. If you combine, you know, her beanie with being made out of wool, or I don't know if it was a helmet, I'm not really sure, but it looks like it's made out of wool. Um, it should just have a little bit, it should be shaped around her skull a little bit more. So really, uh, really um, cornered. <clears throat> All right, so... Before, after. Okay, so the eyes were too small for the head. And uh, 
and the, and the, the head just, just a little bit too circular and silly looking. Um, I think I read in the description of this he used Portrait Studio, which is really cool. I'm so happy you've you've, uh, you've used it and gotten use out of it. Uh, try to have a sharper shadow around the nose area. I just, I'm always uh, worried about students becoming too dependent on the soft shadow. Um, the soft shadow does, won't do much for you. It's not going to make skin look prettier. It's not going to make her look prettier. It's not going to make you look like a better artist for blending them. Blending does not mean you're a better artist. Uh, being able to have the courage to cast a sharp shadow will make you look like a better artist, a stronger artist with stronger technique and uh, stronger, stronger conviction in your technique. So right along here, I'd love to see a sharp shadow. Just you have an opportunity to show off some extra form, so why not take it? I didn't change the face. The face hasn't, you know, I haven't sacrificed her beauty. In fact, I've enhanced it by casting in that shadow, even on the eye shadow of the upper eyelid on the rest of the eye needs to be a little bit more sharp just like that before after <clears throat> um, now the other eye is bigger I think it's just because this one is in shadow that it seems bigger but I'm not really sure I think I think this one is less less wide if anything it's not bigger it's just less wide because again, I think that that uh, bang, her hair, you really were worried about it. But that's, I don't think it's bigger, I think it's just less wide. Okay, before, after. If she's a military girl and she's wearing all this armor, if I was a military girl and I was wearing a bunch of armor and I had to fight through mili you know, the male military ranks and work my way up and be ridiculed and be told I was a weakling or whatever her story was, whatever we pull from life, um, I would probably wouldn't wear a beanie on my head. <clears throat> I'd probably wear the most badass looking armor so I can scare all those other motherfuckers from thinking I'm sort of, sort of weakling. I'm trying to think like her. If you think like her, you make better design choices. Let me close that. <clears throat> I'll talk about the landscape in a second. Um, over here, um, there's no sharpness in the shadows. The eyes are symbolic. Uh, I think you're just dressing up, uh, overly doing the, the, the costume. She does look like a rich priestess or something, which is really cool. You've pulled that off. Uh, but I think after that, uh, it became a little bit of a, hey, I did a really cool face in a study. Let me push it to make it a masterpiece. I don't think it started off with any severe design uh, narrative or any any real purpose. It just you just wanted to dress up your drawing and make it look better. It's nice to do that. It's nice to have a little bit of fun. Just remember that this the masterpiece does, is useful. If you do it too early, it's useful for one thing, and that's showing you where your weaknesses are. Um, if you're trying to paint a full illustration from corner to corner, um, well, corner to corner. Uh, you will uh, you will only you it will only serve as a its only purpose will the only purpose it will serve is to show you um, how little you know at this point. So the eyes are symbolic. You're really good with the skin tones. Work on that. Perfect the skin tones. Bring in some more reds. Bring in some more pinks. Outline the lips less. Lips are symbolic. Nose doesn't really have any structure to it. You are shading radially, which is a great place to start. Um, but I think you should remove all of these excessive props remove the hair, maybe leave the hair and just remove everything else um, and try to perfect your anatomy, your edge work, everything feels very curved and very very stiff and it's because there isn't any real thought given into the gesture of her lower body um, her eyes feel very dreamy, they look like they're looking in the same direction You're, again you have a really great place to start, perfect it, remove the masterpiece how many hours did this take you? probably really long, you probably spent a lot of time going through every single one of these beads um, why not just use that time to perfect, you know, not waste that time in the week to draw a bunch of unnecessary beads, you can draw a bead, bead good job but stop drawing them for now and focus back on the really tough stuff to draw. Perfect the edge work here. Where are the collarbones? Let's see more indication of the collarbones. Don't draw the cleavage symbolically. Don't just throw two lines. Um, what, is there something else she could be doing with her hand? Maybe like um, extend the canvas, make her hands look like they're um, kind of fiddling around with one of her beads or something. Um, maybe study separately horns and they look less like clouds and more like a horn. It has a lot of geometry um, in horn. There's a lot of geometry in horns that people forget. A lot of cube, a lot of the cube is in there. 
<clears throat> all of these things could be studied at a later time instead of combining them now and asking yourself why doesn't it look right. It's because there isn't enough mileage in each of these individual areas. So grayscale your stuff, maybe keep the color. You know what, keep the color, just remove the beads, remove the tattoo, remove the clothing, uh, remove the, the horns and focus only on the anatomy. Perfect that. Everything else, there's a reference for it. Okay, for this one, there's a cast shadow moving across the landscape. It looks like a cast shadow. I'm not sure what this is, but I, I read it as a cast shadow in the first time you drew it. But then the light is coming from here, casting this shadow. But before, I think you cast the shadow this way. And then throwing off the reflection on the ground. Um, I'm just a little confused where the light source is coming from. One of the biggest issues in here is... Uh, just lack of edge work and um, you should probably think about the golden uh, spiral, how you can use the spiral to wait, this, this way, how you can use the spiral to kind of refocus the, 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 the detail maybe shrink the character to make this feel more colossal scale is an amazing tool to use, when we shrink our character the landscape feels much bigger and the camera feels like it's much more distant from the character. It feels like a helicopter panning scene or a wide shot or um, panning shot, whatever. Um, it makes everything feel massive. One area where they use this is, um, is in Star Wars. What is it? Episode 7 or episode this? Episode 7. Star Wars Episode 7 first scene. I hope they're showing... I hope they show... Oh yeah, this. This is madness. I think she like rides across in her moped or whatever it is. But look at how massive this is. She's so tiny. They could have made her like this big. But this wouldn't have felt so colossal. This is like the remnants of the starship, right? When it exploded or something. So this right here feels massive. This is an amazing... Look at that atmospheric fade. You can still have detail in the distance. But it's generally very blurred compared to the detail in the foreground. This is massive um, scale comparison. <clears throat> So uh, this is what you want to work with. You want to mess around. The character doesn't have to be that detailed. If they are, make the horizon a little higher. Make the you know move it, move a little bit closer. If it's about the character, make the canvas longer. Uh, a little longer canvas look like that um, better than uh, actually. Let me just crop it for you. Be better than having a landscape. You're not really respecting the landscape by making the character. Uh, smaller. It's about the character and this and this ball of this kind of like a biome, I don't know what it's called. This kind of thing with flowers in it. <clears throat> um, so maybe, maybe make make the canvas a little like this, but if you are going to make the wide canvas uh, then this is what you have to do. Use scale to your advantage. Raise things along the horizon line at a higher point. This is horizon line number two. This is the second horizon line way off in the distance that we're seeing the layering of, of different mountains and, and heights and altitudes. So focus back to your light source. What is this big blotch thing? It's taking a lot of my attention away. Um, these chains are a little bit distracting. The cast shadows, um, no, no, not the cast shadows. Well, there aren't any severe cast shadows. They need to take the shape of the object casting them if everything is moving this way. So this whole area here needs to be cast <clears throat> in shadow. And, uh, and the, the sand itself, the color of the sand, is way too saturated. Uh, you're showing off like that. The, if, if this is terraforming, if this is the actual earth, um, red soil like that, it just doesn't sit in, in random places. Red soil kind of has like a selective area, and it's only when it's wet and it's in these really tropical areas. But a barren desert, it just doesn't have these kinds of colors in it. If the camera is overexposing and it, we're getting lots of sound is into my computer. Um, getting lots of, of light and we've edited the photo maybe at that point we'll get like an orangey beige tan color, that sandy color. But that orange you had is really really vibrant. It's kind of like the color of a, of a flower. Like if nature does have this color it's used for a flower. Don't know why that sound is happening on my computer. It's odd. Okay, and um, so those are the changes I would make. Shit, did I lose everything? No. These are the changes I would make. You either crop the image and make it about her and that, or you think about the effect of scaling. How scale? How important is she really? Is she that important to you that you have to have 
her to be this size, make her a little bit smaller. It just feels like it's one shot in a panning shot that's zooming up on her. Even the camera in a movie would have eventually zoomed up on her. Um, if we really want to make make the audience in the movie feel like they can just give them a chance to sink in the environment, I would zoom out all the way. It should be very small, just like they did here. Very amazing, guided, deliberate choices in the design. This. <clears throat> and then this here, um, again, exactly the same as the other girl with the beads on her. You need some studies behind you. You need a lot of studies behind you before you can try this again and really do it justice. This theme, do it justice. Um, you're kind of like expressing that she's this uh, like guiding light, like a Galadriel kind of character in a world of death. Cool. It's a cool theme. Go for it. Make the canvas a little less. It's not about the background. If it's not about the background, you make the canvas long. If it's about the background, you make the canvas wide. But that said, you're outlining. There isn't enough knowledge in your mind right now for collarbone area. You don't have enough anatomy knowledge and mileage for you to know what to do when you get to the shoulder. So what you did was outline. Yeah, it's white, but it's still an outline. Over here, all overly defined, symbolic. When I say neck, you probably think about the neck tendons. And you've overly defined it, so now it feels like she has a masculine neck compared to her really delicate, scrawny, kind of um, uh, really, really thin, slender body. The hair is drawn with single pixel width brush strokes. Again, another bad choice that can be addressed on a grayscale sandbox environment study. Um, remove the extra little features and just focus on what you're doing here. This is way more detailed than the eyes, and this is the biggest no-no. We need to have the eyes the most focused in a portrait. You have a great hold over the nostrils, and you have a great hold over the over the anatomy and, and the face. You can start from there and perfect that. Go down into the bust of the body. If you're really interested in, in perfecting your portraits, if you want to be a portrait artist, um, but uh, but yeah, please remember that there is a great benefit for you if you consider things before you master, try to master them. I mean, you can't master a long jump if you haven't tried at least 1,000 attempts at the long jump. So um, you're trying something you haven't drawn enough, and you're expecting your mind and your brain to perform for you where you don't have enough mileage behind you. Okay, a lot of this is repeated stuff, but maybe someone in the audience might grow an appreciation for it. Um, when they see it repeated through other other students, they, they're not alone. Those two, the, those those last two female portraits, they're both suffering from the exact same thing. You you two should meet up and and kind of just like have study hour together. Talk about your issues. Talk about why you think, you, why you think you've painted it with a line. What you can do to make the, the shoulders feel more realistic. All of these things, you guys should partner up and take them on together if you're suffering from the same issues. Over here, um, it's a general fear to have an edge. I really would love to see some edges here. Just just like along, like he's so visible, the guy, but the ground under him isn't. The ground under him is way more dense than he is. There should be a, like a, a, an edge somewhere, just like that. And then another edge in the foreground that's much darker than that, just like that. Um, maybe something in the, in the near foreground too, like another piece. <clears throat> it feels very, uh, very separated. Everything feels very separated from e from each other. Um, careful not to let the sunshine change the color of the sky. This only really happens at sunset or at dusk, and the sky is just not blue. It's a little bit more orange. It's a little bit more yellowish in color. That's the only time that yellow really happens. So you have no edges. You have no um, separation between all of these 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 angles. I mean these distances and, and uh, <clears throat> these these points in the distance. Mr. Brack, any general tips for someone who really wants to start making portraits? Uh, Danny PC asks. Um, I think the most important thing to get in your head is that the most detailed area should be the portrait, the face area. Nothing should be more detailed than the face. If at, at one, if at any point you start shrinking your brush smaller and start painting it, uh, painting with it on an area that is not an eye just stop. At that point, just stop. Focus your focal point towards the portrait, the crosshair of the features, and nothing else. Everything should be a step down in detail. 
Um, yeah, that's really cool, Anime Dragon. Uh, awesome idea. Who wants to open a Skype or Discord study, studying group? Be careful with those. They tend to be very general, and they don't really get to the point. Try to get, like, one or two people you know very well who you know, not very well, who you know have the same issues as you do. Get a hold of them. Contact them. The two people that posted this, contact each other. Um, and uh, the, the, the girl with the beads and the other Galadriel girl. You guys should contact each other and... Um, and, and start studying together, show each other your stuff, critique each other, you'll improve much faster than you think. And I'm not talking a year from now, I'm talking a couple months, and you'll be exactly where you want to be. But um, that's it for today. Thank you everyone for watching. Have a great day, guys. Bye-bye.